is a device to slide through time. The longer I travel, the harder it is to control. I got two charges, one to get me here, one to get me home. Well, that's just lazy writing. One of the more interesting results of big budget franchises lasting as long as they have is that they've gotten a lot more self-aware. Having decades of criticism being levied at them, these newer installments are often the first to point out the flaws in their series. So, it's big. Now, genre satire, genre homage, genre deconstruction, these are nothing new. But what is new are franchises taking aim at their own series. We've seen films riff on or be inspired by Star Wars, but now, actual Star Wars films are joining in on the fun. The sequel trilogy is actually a pretty great primer in the ways a series can reflect on its legacy. The Force Awakens is textbook pastiche, The Last Jedi is a subversive deconstruction, and The Rise of Skywalker is, of course, parody. Somehow Palpatine returned. <laughs> By pointing out the tropes of their genre, these films get a sort of get-out-of-jail-free card when it comes to criticism. For instance, is Snoke a clever commentary on the one-dimensional villains of the series, or is he just a Palpatine clone born to create conflict? There is no correct answer, as it varies from person to person and from film to film. I made Snoke. Man, Rise of Skywalker is such a brilliant parody. The best of these self-aware blockbusters are the ones that take their meta criticisms and use them as jumping off points to explore newer, interesting ideas. This is where the R-rated X-Men films really shine, providing thrills that their PG-13 predecessors never could. Not only have these movies transcended the older films in their series, but they've also done so by building on the foundation laid out in these earlier films. The jokes in Deadpool and the heart-wrenching drama in Logan are only enhanced by our shared history with this series. The strengths of these films can only exist through the flaws that came before. At their core, these are films and filmmakers wrestling with their legacies, identifying the good and bad elements of their past, and trying to find a new way to make them compelling. But there is one blockbuster that points out the flaws in its genre, only to indulge in the worst tropes and ideas in the series thus far. A blockbuster that is aware of the issues that plague its series, but then doubles down on these issues going forward. Welcome to Jurassic World. Jurassic World is a 2015 sequel and homage to Jurassic Park that does two new things with this series. It provides a meta-critique of the Jurassic Park franchise, and it finally opens John Hammond's iconic park. These two new elements aren't exactly exclusive, as the life of the park feeds into the film's meta-commentary. The core of this commentary is that this park feels different from the original. John Hammond's guiding hand is no longer there so all the whimsy and wonder he brought to the park goes with him. That first park was legit. This lack of magic is most felt when the iconic theme music plays over a wide shot of the theme park. The success of the island is more important than the wonder of these dinosaurs. This is all intentional. The film is deliberately undermining John Hammond's vision. Now, John Hammond's character is one of the most interesting things about the first film. In Michael Crichton's novel, Hammond is incredibly harsh and egotistical. Yes, he loves these dinosaurs, but he mainly sees the park as a business investment, clinging to keeping the park alive even as his grandchildren are in danger. It should also be pointed out that in the novel, Hammond is killed by his own creations. In the film, Dr. Hammond is portrayed far more sympathetically, with the great Richard Attenborough injecting the role with a Walt Disney-level charm. While the character still has negative attributes, namely his treatment of his employees, Hammond's critical flaw turns out to be his infectious love for these dinosaurs. This love blinds him to the troubles within his park, ranging from the motives of his staff to what these dinosaurs really are. His wish to share these wonders with the world puts his loved ones and himself in danger, and he is shown firsthand how bad an idea Jurassic Park really is. There's one line in Jurassic Park 3 that sums up the conflict of this series rather nicely. This was a stupid decision, but I did it with the best intentions. With the best intentions. Some of the worst things imaginable have been done with the best intentions. 
Instead of being murdered by his own creation, Hammond instead has to suffer a far worse fate. He has to give up the park. And by building this relationship out of love and wonder, the film ultimately holds more meaning. But this also sets up a roadblock for potential sequels. The park is a bad idea. Everyone knows it's a bad idea. And even the man who created it agrees that it should never open. After careful consideration, I've decided not to endorse your park. So have I. So if we ever want to see the park in all its glory, there can no longer be good intentions. Welcome to Jurassic World. There's only one character from Jurassic Park that returns for this sequel. It's not Dr. Grant or Dr. Sattler, Tim, Lex, or even the legendary Ian Malcolm. No, the only returning character is Dr. Henry Wu. Now, B.D. Wan's role in the first film is incredibly minor. He has one scene as Jurassic Park's head scientist that the guests meet on their tour. In this scene, Henry has very little characterization and is mainly there for expository dialogue. He gets into an argument with Ian Malcolm over controlling the dinosaur's chromosomes to keep them female. Well, somebody go out in the park and pull up the dinosaur's skirts. But for the most part, Henry is an eager scientist, another man with good intentions about to do tremendous harm. In Jurassic World, he now has a black Steve Jobs turtleneck. So yeah, he's bad. One of the major flaws in Dr. Wu's dinosaurs in the first film was his use of frog DNA to fill in the genetic code leading to dinosaurs that can change genders in a single sex environment. The shortcuts taken to create the dinosaurs had unforeseen side effects, eradicating all control they had over these animals. By Jurassic World, Henry has not learned his lesson. Instead, his continued use of other species for the dinosaur hybrid the Indominus Rex is the catalyst for the film's conflict. The Indominus Rex is the nexus of the film's meta-commentary on Hollywood sequels, a monstrous being created only to boost profits. Like many sequels, the Indominus Rex is built to please plenty of people. Shareholders, sponsors, and most importantly, audiences. The decisions to cater to all these people are what turn it into such an effective killing machine. The use of tree frogs to adapt the Indominus Rex to Jurassic World's tropical climate cause it to modulate its infrared output and trick Jurassic World's security. Additionally, the cattlefish used to speed up its growth development gifted the oh-so-crucial ability to camouflage. Instead of taking responsibility for this being, Dr. Root defends his decisions, shifting blame to Jurassic World's eccentric CEO. Who authorized you to do this? You did. Bigger. Scarier. Um, cooler, I believe is the word that you used in your memo. Just as Dr. Wu no longer resembles his past self, Mr. Masrani is a shell of the man whose shoes he's filling, echoing Hammond's iconic words without the weight or love behind them. Spare no expense. While not an outright terrible person, his ignorance and negligence sets the park up for disaster. He is a consumer of his own park, treating his helicopter rides as their own attraction. This consumer mindset, the desire for fun new toys, leads to disaster with his latest product. You cannot have an animal with exaggerated predator features without the corresponding behavioral traits. Well, I don't know what I expected. The last key player in this park's demise is Vic Hoskins, played gloriously by Vincent D'Onofrio. Hoskins' character is only interested in the dinosaurs to use them for military operations. Throughout the narrative, it is revealed that he is in cahoots with Dr. Wu to prepare a new dinosaur that will change the world of war. The entire park is a cover for malicious intentions, and when questioned on the morality of his actions, Henry responds, If I don't innovate, somebody else will. If Jurassic World was just a story about bad people doing bad things, it wouldn't be that interesting. So in order to combat the inherent cynicism of its premise, it gives a character arc to Claire. If we look back at the first Jurassic Park for reference, the character she has the most in common with is Donald Gennaro, aka the bloodsucking lawyer. Like Gennaro, the part of the island Claire is most interested in are the profits, as it's her job to make sure that Jurassic World remains financed and running. The defining action for Gennaro was that when the park fell apart, he abandoned Lex and Tim to seek shelter, resulting in his karmic death. When you gotta go, you gotta go. Claire, on the other hand, has a bigger role in this story, 
as the asset she's so keen on preserving breaks free while her nephews are in the park. Once this happens, Claire instead finds herself in the role of Dr. Grant. Both of these characters don't care much for children. You don't know how old your nephews are? Yet when these kids are in danger, they have to step up as their surrogate parental figures. This is made explicit in Jurassic World by Zack and Gray's parents sending them on this trip to cover for their divorce. While the film goes a bit too hard on Claire being uber-focused on her work, I do think that this character turn is an interesting idea. Her world puts her family in jeopardy, and she's forced to transform to keep them safe. See, the island, as chaotic as it is, is a metaphor for life. The first Jurassic Park illustrates this rather beautifully, as it throws something horrifying at these kids that they're entirely unprepared for. But then, Dr. Grant steps in, using the knowledge and skills at his disposal to evade them from harm. From here on out, this lovely trio is stuck together, with the kids relying on Dr. Grant to get them back to safety. He left us! He left us! But that's not what I'm gonna do. The three of them face off a series of obstacles, with the kids staying by Dr. Grant's side. With this protection, the kids get to interact with the dinosaurs, learning that not all of them are bad. Some of these obstacles they're not ready for, but Alan is still there to get them to safety. Finally, Alan succeeds, bringing the kids back to the visitor center, and then leaves them for a brief moment in the kitchen. But this is Jurassic Park. Nowhere is safe. For once, the kids have to fend off these dinos on their own and using the skills obtained by staying with Dr. Grant, they work together and make it out alive. Jurassic Park is a metaphor for parenting and growing up, creating a nurturing relationship for children in a chaotic environment so they can prepare for what the rest of the world has in store. But in Jurassic World, Zack and Grey need no preparation. Through some pretty heavy plot armor, they survive their first encounter with the Indominus Rex. Knowing that they're out there alone, Claire ventures out to save them and live up to Dr. Grant before her. But she doesn't. The boys make their way back to her by themselves. Even worse, Claire brings them back into danger after they already made their way to the front of the park. While the film tries to redeem Claire through her family, it doesn't give them the time to build their dynamic. So if these boys don't serve Claire's story, why are they even in this movie? There are few things as nostalgic to me as the first Jurassic Park. It's not only a film from my childhood, but one about looking to the past and growing up. Jurassic World aims to tap into our collective nostalgia, mainly by viewing this newer park through the eyes of Zack and Grey. Every scene with them is merely there to indulge in the glory of this park. The narrative tells us that this park is bad, but their scenes showcase that it's amazing. This could set us up for a reveal like the first film, but not once do these kids question the attractions they're witnessing. Yes, the adults got caught up in the whimsy of the first park, but they also pointed out the cracks in the foundation leading up to the eventual chaos. These kids don't point out the problems because they're kids, and they're not here to serve the story. The biggest example of this is their journey to the first Jurassic Park. While on the surface, they're building up their brotherly bond, or something. Are you gonna cry? In reality, this scene is only there to reminisce in this iconic imagery. Ask yourself, what does this scene do besides remind you of the first film? Despite Grey's genius knowledge of dinosaurs, not once does he say anything revealing about them. But if there's one character more connected with the dinosaurs, it would be... Now that we've gotten all of Jurassic World's characters out of the way, we can finally talk about its star, Owen Grady. Now, Owen is a bit of an anomaly for the Jurassic Park franchise. This is a series at its best when children are in trouble and are screaming. Plus, character attempts to confront the dinosaurs seldom work. Clever girl. So it's weird to have a full-on Indiana Jones-esque action hero at the center of this movie. This decision is further complicated by the casting of Chris Pratt. Now, Pratt has made his fame by being the lovable goofball. Part of his charm is seeing Andy from Parks and Rec in a superhero blockbuster. Most of his bigger roles maintain his silliness, 
often using Pratt's character to poke at the conventions of typical male action stars, if not outright critiquing them. And the prophecy states that you're the most important, most talented, most interesting, and most extraordinary person in the universe. That's you, right? Uh, yes. That's me. This is not the case here as Pratt has transformed into all the conventions his previous roles lampooned. Whereas those characters go on journeys of maturity, Owen is perfect from his first frame. The character in Jurassic World that resembles Pratt's other roles the most is Larry played by Jake Johnson. In a film about deconstructing the Jurassic Park franchise, Larry feels like he should be more of a central figure. He's a fan of the first film, or Park, and is critical of the directions given by his bosses. It was an eventuality, okay? You should put that in the brochure. Eventually, one of these things will eat somebody. He's a fun character, and provides some of the funniest gags in the movie. Oh, no, I, I have a boyfriend. But these gags are rendered useless by Owen's macho awesomeness, which is ultimately a regression of Jurassic Park's more progressive ideals. We can discuss sexism and survival situations when I get back. Can we stay with you? I am never leaving you as long as you live. No, 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 him! The thing I take biggest issue with is Owen being the moral center of this film. Whereas the first film had multiple varying perspectives, each one adding new insights to the park, Jurassic World only ever has two perspectives. Owen who is always right, Evacuate the island. and Corporate who is always wrong. We'd never reopen. You can view this film as a flat arc narrative, with Owen reading corporate influence from these dinosaurs, but that fails to account for his own crucial flaw. He's complicit with this system. Owen isn't a particularly deep character. He doesn't have any big aspirations or goals. He seemingly just really likes dinosaurs, so he works at Jurassic World. The film could give him an arc about learning to let go of these dinosaurs, but it never once challenges him on his blatant hypocrisy. I don't control the raptors, it's a relationship. Stay away from my animals. While Owen may not think he owns the dinosaurs, he does think of them as family. So out of anyone, he has the best chance of doing so. This is put to the test when Vic Hoskins forces the raptors to take on the Indominus Rex. In the most revealing line in the film, he tells Owen, This is happening! With or without you. Owen is the moral center, the audience stand-in, and he's forced to comply with bad intentions in order to salvage a terrible situation. I can think of no more apt comparison to modern blockbuster filmmaking. Despite his years of experience with these creatures, the raptors are not under his control. The secret DNA in the Indominus Rex being part raptor causes them to turn on their humans. Raptors got a new alpha! Now this is the most interesting set piece in the film, especially as the cameras on the raptors' heads are used for great dramatic effect. For Owen, this creates a major moment of reflection, questioning his bond with his raptors and whether they even care about him. But that reflection blows up before our eyes. In the end, the film reaffirms Owen's bond by him taking off Blue's camera. Their bond was real. The raptors can be controlled. And the problem was never with Owen, it was with another negative influence. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! Since the beginning of cinema, there have been mad scientists and monsters. Creatures and special effects built to terrorize the world and audience that deep down we secretly love. No genre has more love than movie monsters. It's why I'm so drawn to the work of Guillermo del Toro, who imbues so much passion into every design. Each of his monsters is a vessel for fear and meaning. Del Toro in particular tells stories about men and monsters, and how our fear in monsters pales in comparison to his fear of men. Jurassic World shares this fear, as its central monster is made by bad intentions. It causing havoc isn't a bug, it's the core design. This thing murders, and Dr. Wu doesn't care. That's unfortunate. As the focal point for the film's meta-commentary, the Indominus Rex is the cool but empty sequel. She's corporate interests manifested into a monster. Yet despite their desire for a cool product, nothing about the Indominus Rex ends up cool. Its skin is pale grey, its roar sounds more like a screech, and it has an unsettling hanging jaw. 
Her appearance is more off-putting than intimidating. She's the sick result of a scrambled identity. None of this is a criticism. In fact, the idea behind the Indominus Rex is the strongest one in the film. There's an interesting story with this dinosaur. Owen as a character works the best when he's psychoanalyzing this beast, trying to understand and predict its behavior like a detective thriller. As Owen follows its destructive trail, he discovers that it's a truly damaged being. Its rampage is born from its apparent alienation. This creature has no idea what it is, and only by making its way up the food chain can she figure it out. She knows nothing but pain and destruction, spreading these things to everyone else on the island. And the film has nothing but contempt for her. This creature embodies the spirit of soulless sequels, so the only way to combat it is with the hardy spirit of the classic. I take no issue with this, and saving Her Majesty the T-Rex for this final battle is a very smart choice. What I do take issue with is this scene becoming a pure celebration of these icons, using the Indominus Rex as a punching bag. Just because it embodies and was made by bad intentions, doesn't make it evil. The villain in Frankenstein isn't Frankenstein's monster, it was always Frankenstein. This story makes a false association between the creator and the creation, using all its pent-up anger on the creation while the creator gets away scot-free. Cause remember, there must be a sequel. I'm not asking for much. A moment of sympathy where we acknowledge how much pain this being has went through. But instead, its death is a gag. <laughs> because this scene was never about the tragedy of the Indominus Rex. It was about how That first park was legit. And with that, the film's core metaphor fades away to the film's true message. The film sacrificed its own story to celebrate the original. Good stories breed greater stories. Whenever I watch a good movie, I'm motivated to make my own story and see if I can make it just as compelling. With these franchises, we want to see the same thing. We want to see filmmakers inspired by their predecessors to try to make something better. But Jurassic World knows it can't top Jurassic Park, so it does the next best thing. It reminds you that it can't be topped. And it's scary how effective this cynical technique can be. Despite the end product, I don't think the filmmakers made this film insidiously. It's clear from the behind-the-scenes footage that Colin Trevorrow and co. made this film to tell their own story. In the end, Jurassic World is a film made with the best intentions. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Turns out I had a lot to say about this series, and if this video does well, perhaps I can talk more about the sequel. Till then, make sure you're subscribed with notifications, support us on Patreon, and take care.